so really, really, and this is a really, really um, special event for me as well. We we're joined by the Hong Kong Shacks Theater Group, uh, which is uh, a, a nonprofit society based in Hong Kong. They, their work focuses on identity expression and cultural exchange and takes special interest in cultural adaptations and recontextualizations uh, in their cultural uh, and creative products. Uh, and you can learn more about them at uh, hkstg.org. Um, the people who, they will be doing some of the readings that uh, they've selected from the two plays. Uh, and uh, the performers and the readers include um, Ushval Sharma, then Subang Rohit Sharma, uh, Gitika Sachandani, uh, Hana Miranda, uh, Monima Pun, Nicole Ning, Rosalind Wong, and uh, they will be doing uh, sets of uh, three sets of readings uh, in between discussions. Um, the organization of this event is a little complicated, um, uh, but I will give you kind of the quick rundown. What we'll do is we'll have a, a kind of a brief discussion followed by a reading from either Contempt uh, or Pride, and then followed by another discussion, followed another by discussion. Um, uh, after the first reading, uh, Professor Wang will offer a, a really very, very thankful for him to offer a, a, a kind of formal response. And then for the, 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 the next two, after the readings two and three, there'll be a more formal, kind of informal uh, panel discussion. And at any point, uh, especially after the third time, I, you know, we'll open it up to Q&A from, uh, from you and I mean, please, please feel free to be part of the discussion. Um, uh, as a kind of uh, Zoom technical feature, what you might find to be useful uh, this is thanks to Danish, um, is that when the panel discussion is going on, the view that's most helpful is likely the gallery view. But when the readings are occurring, you can change this up in the right-hand corner. Uh, you want to speak to, sh uh, speak to uh, shift to speaker view. Uh, and then that way you have the, you get the full access of, uh, of the actor's performance uh, in its largest possible um, uh, uh, um, sense. Uh, and so, right, I think that includes, I think I have gone through my entire uh, housekeeping introductory notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, what I'll do is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very excited to have Danish here to celebrate the release of his book. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of seeing Contempt uh, uh, from some of its early stages, some of its really amazing performances in a, a few different places around the world. And so to see it in book form is even more exciting. Um, but I'll hand it over to Danish actually to, to say a bit about the kind of context uh, for these two plays um, and the writing process and how they came into existence. Um, thanks so much, Daniel. And I really appreciate you putting it together. And also, it's an honor um, to hear that from you. So we just spent, um, we have this book club at the Melbourne Law School, and we just had a wonderful discussion on Daniel's new book, which is on World Literature for the Wretched of the Earth. And so we're really looking forward to hearing um, more from Daniel when he does a workshop with us later in the year. But um, so thank you, thank you. This, this, this means a lot and I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, there's so many awful things about Zoom, uh, but it's also so wonderful to be able to share this space together. Um, and so just to start by acknowledging a few things about where I am. So um, I'm seated in, uh, and I'm a resident of, a building called the Institute of Postcolonial Studies uh, in the city of Nam or Melbourne. And somewhat ironically, this institute is located on Curzon Street, which is named after George Curzon, the British Viceroy General of India who presided over a famine, which cost a few million lives, give or take. So, um, and to stay with that contradiction, the institute also stands on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the East Kulin Nation. And I am an uninvited guest to these lands. And, uh, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present for their care of country and for their cultivation of lawful relations. So that question of lawful relations. So this book has, um, it's meant many things uh, over the years, but one core idea has been this attempt to try and work out and work through what it means to live with law and um and so the story of the book um starts it probably starts in 1860 with the instatement of the indian penal code as part of a systematic codification of criminal laws by the british but we won't start uh, we'll, we'll you know there's a limited time for this event so we'll start in 2012 
uh, and I was a member of um, a collective of human rights lawyers in India, and we were part of a larger litigation team, and it was challenging the constitutional validity of the colonial sodomy law. Um, so this legacy that we've had in place from 1860. So I just graduated from law school and I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, we were here in Delhi. Um, the final hearings in this case were taking place over a six week period. Um, and that's, that's quite long, even for a judicial system that's not known for its speedy, speedy disposal of cases. Um, and in fact, I think that's around the time that Daniel was in Delhi doing his Fulbright. So, oh my God, 2012. So anyway, so here we are and, um, and a lot happened inside that courtroom. So like there's hours and hours of back and forth between the lawyers and the judges. And that translated to hundreds of pages of court transcripts and that will become relevant in just a bit. But being in that courtroom was not a pleasant experience. So every evening as the hearings would wrap up, I would feel this immense weariness descend on me and, and this huge weight, this, uh, which would just kind of keep accumulating was because the judges would just not listen. So obviously the element of listening is crucial. We literally call it a courtroom hearing, um, but hearing and listening is not the same thing. So I can hear the things you say, but if I don't sit and respond to them, I haven't listened to you. And it was very clear um, first when I was in the courtroom and then later when I read and reread the transcripts from those hearings that they hadn't listened to us because we were telling them over and over, look, here is a colonial era law. It criminalizes carnal intercourse against the order of nature. It is a matter of historical record. It's intended to target homosexual activity. Here are all these stories of queer people. Um, but the judges would just say over and over, no, the law talks about carnal intercourse against the order of nature. It doesn't actually refer to LGBT people. There is no evidence. Um, anyway, LGBT people are a minuscule minority. It doesn't really matter. So every exchange in the courtroom would kind of boil down to this. The law is presenting this evidence, the judge is deflecting, pivoting to legal language. Anyway, so when the final um, judgment was handed down, which was in December, 2013, uh, it wasn't really a shock. Uh, when the judges ruled that the sodomy law did not violate constitutional rights. But again, you can be not shocked, but also feel this immense amount of grief uh, and anger. And then I was surprised by this last emotion, but also shame. Um, so the first play in uh, Love and Reparation, which is called Contempt, is a way of responding to and a way of dissenting to this judgment. And so I, I go back to those transcripts in the courtroom and I sift through those exchanges and I draw the ways in which the judges derelicted a constitutional duty. So the way in which the judges failed to listen. Um, and that was initially what the play was, but um, as I was trying to work my way through those transcripts, there's another question that emerged. So um, not listening um, is also possibly a matter of not speaking accurately or not speaking well or not speaking in a certain way. And so there's a responsibility that lawyers have as storytellers, um, you know, so as people who take a story of loss that happens outside the courtroom and, and translate it into legal language. And the way that lawyers do this is through um, a document, it's called the affidavit. Um, it becomes a bridge between the law and the statute and the law as it's lived. And in this case, it felt like the affidavits, when they were trying to tell a story about loss to the court, leached out the life within that story. So each of those queer lives was kind of stripped to the barest of facts, the most precise narrative constructed to provide evidence of harm. And somewhere in that production of evidence, the person behind the story disappears. So with contempt, the second thing I did there was um, interleaving scenes in the courtroom with stories that I label uh, affidavits. And so these are accounts of queer lives and each of those accounts begins with one foot planted in reality, but from there they sort of meandered, they followed imagined paths, they sort of resisted the neatness of the conventional affidavit. So that was 2017, that began a run of what would eventually go on to be 30 shows in different spaces. And you know, those conversations are really productive. And 
And for a while that was it. But then in 2018, the court did something unexpected and it decided to strike down the law after all. And that's wonderful. So now the intimate lives of queer citizens of the country are no longer criminalized. Hooray, you know, you're free. The law is gone, let's all move on. But, um, but actually it turns out, um, and for anyone who's been in uh, <laughs> any kind of relationship, moving on is harder than we think. So here's the quote and it's saying, here is the end of criminalization, but how clear this end is and how clear the line between the past and the future is and what it means to live with full sexual citizenship um, are only questions that start emerging once this formal law is struck down. So um, something I talk about in the preface to this book, but there was this uh, massive party in Delhi uh, following the verdict and there were these chants of Azadi all around, um, freedom. And, and I remember being in a corner of this dance floor and feeling sweat on me that's not mine and feeling and sensing smoke on my breath that isn't mine and feeling anything but free. This was not the freedom that I felt like I, I was arguing for. So the law was gone, but it didn't feel gone. Um, and, and so the question I was asking was, how do you A, let this law go? And how do you learn to live and love in the aftermath of legality? And so that's a question that the follow up play to contempt, which is called pride starts answering. And so um, how do you learn to live? A very good space for that is therapy. And so pride is structured as a series of conversations in a therapeutic space, a lot of which I drew from conversations that I had with my therapist. Um, but also it's important for me to note that this, neither of these plays are memoir. They do draw from personal narrative, but they're not telling a story about this person who is Danish. Um, and that's, that's been kind of pretty crucial for me to hold on to. Um, yeah, so anyway, so, so as I was writing Contempt and as I was kind of going through these stories in therapy, it kind of emerged, uh, one, one, of the, one of the crucial things is, uh, one of the crucial things that therapy does is it's about asking you the stories or asking you to account for the stories that you're telling yourself and then re-narrativize them and say maybe you can break free or break out of the rut you're in if you start telling yourself a different kind of story. Um, and I started seeing parallels between that kind of storytelling and the ways in which people were trying to tell the story of this case. Because that's the other thing, when you have a massive victory, there will be people who rush in to claim the victory. And so you have activists and you have lawyers and you have celebrities leaping in and each of the, those actors has a different way of casting the narrative, the case. And so I started drawing those narratives uh, alongside this one personal story and that became the second play. Um, why is the book called Love and Reparation? There is a reason for that, but actually I'd rather not talk about it in the launch. If you do pick up the book, if you read the preface, it's right there. Um, but I maybe I'll just, um, yeah, leave to Daniel to take us forward. Thank you so much. I am uh, will now pass it over to uh, Shax uh, to do the first reading, which is from Contempt. Um, and so this is the time if you were going to switch your view to switch from gallery mode to uh, speaker mode uh, and really enjoy their performance. Your Lordships, I stand before you in the matter of Navdej Johar versus Union of India. Five years ago, this court made a decision that impacted the lives of millions of LGBT persons in this country. A decision that said LGBTQ persons were minuscule minorities, undeserving of their so-called rights. A decision that has been publicly acknowledged by this very court as a discordant note within its institutional history of protecting rights. Your Lordships, once again, we argue that section 377 of the Indian Penal Code is unconstitutional. Our petitioners stand in this courtroom before you and ask you a question. How strongly must we love knowing we are convicted felons? How long do we have to wait? We have waited. We have waited 158 years. We have waited and watched as our fundamental freedoms have remained restrained under colonial era law, forcing us to live as second-class citizens. 
And so, your lordships, the matter of millions of LGBTQ citizens in this country who have waited, and the matter of my clients who have lived their lives in the shadow of a law waiting, we ask, on what side of history will this court stand? What's this one? I love you. I love you. These words come way too easily to me. So I go on a date with this guy, second date. He picks one of those timeout featured restaurants, orders the second cheapest wine on the menu, doesn't check his phone more than once in the evening, is reasonably non-disappointing in bed, and then the next morning offers to make coffee. And that's it. That's all it takes. And it just comes tumbling right out. Thanks for the coffee, I love you. And then of course he looks all horrified and goes stumbling out of the house before I can explain that I really meant to say love with a small L, like font size seven, like the outer ring road of love. You know who got this? The Greeks, the ancient Greeks. They understood the big difference between the I love yous of good sex and the I love yous that lead to joint tax declarations. They knew that no one word could capture the infinite messiness of love. And so they had several. Ludus, playful love. Pragma, long-standing love. Philia, love of the mind. Agape, love of the soul. Storch, love of the child. And Philosia, love of the self. And then, and then there was another kind of love. A love rooted in erotic frenzy. A love that could shatter worlds. Eros. That's what they called it. And one night, thousands of years ago, a group of men gathered together in ancient Greece to honor Eros. There were eight of them that night at the house of Agathon. The tables groaned with food and goblets of wine. A gentle music ser serenaded them as the summer night breeze wafted through the room, plucking beads of sweat glistening on their uncovered bodies. There were eight of them. A statesman, a doctor, a playwright, a poet, a philosopher, a lawyer. Outside the door of the house, there was another man listening, waiting, hoping. His name was Alcibiades, and he's, but he's not important just yet. For now, it's these men, getting drunk and delivering odes to the glory, the magnificence of Eros. They tell us how Eros is mania, how it is poetry, how it is medicine for the soul, how it is a quest for the other half of the soul. They agree that Eros is crucial, that it is vital. And finally, they come to Socrates, who of course must have the last word because he is Socrates the Great, Socrates the father of Western philosophy. And he says, well, Eros, meh, Eros is fine, Eros is good. But really, let's do away with the carnal pleasures of the flesh. Let's do away this eros. Let's climb the ladder of beauty. Let's move towards a higher good. Let's reject eros. What's this three? I have known Swapna since the time that I knew fire could hurt you. We are 10 and walking to school together. I'm half a pace behind her claiming each of her footprints as mine. We are one unit, and they know it, and they see it before we do. Look, here comes Swapna Suchita. We are 12, and she is giving me max tuitions, but I'm not that bad, and she's not that good, but she is giving me tuitions anyway, because then, after the tuitions, she can stay with me, and then we lie together at night, talking, confirming each of them for each other because what she sees, I might see, but it is always transformed by how she sees it, and I want to know every last detail. Our conversations repeat themselves endlessly, but even that observation becomes another conversation when we talk and talk ourselves to sleep. We are 15 and sharing a mango, and she slices it tenderly, and she gives me a slice, the big slice, for her generosity is lost on me. I can only see that when she bites into the flesh of a thin line of the juice races down her chin and past her throat, thin defiant streak of orange disappearing into crisp white blouse. 
She is gazing at a point in the distance, and I think how generous is my Swapna. She's letting me gaze undisturbed. I did not realize then how she takes just as much pleasure from me looking at her. We are 17, and she still gives me tuitions, and this is just another night after just another tuition. But this night, we play a game where she traces equations on my arm, such as my teacher, and then she traces her name on my navel. And we giggle at first, but then she moves her finger down, and I can't laugh. She moves further down, and all I can do is move closer and let her disappear into me. We are 19, and she is home with me when the first boy's family comes to visit. She walks with me such confidence to the room that we're sitting in. She even makes the tea for him, and she asks shyly if she is my sister. That becomes our joke. Later that night, when we lie together and she whispers, sister, dear sweet sister, into the nape of my neck. And now we are 20, and our stories are coming to an end. I cannot be sure when it was clear we were on borrowed time, but we both knew at the same moment. She came to my house that night, though there were no tuition excuses left. But no one asked, no one suspected. And when it came to it, in those final moments, we didn't cry. It isn't that we were being brave for each other. We were sure that this would be just another conversation where we'd fall asleep and then wake up and find each other again. When they found our bodies, they will see them tied together with a piece of cloth around our waists. We thought that would help. We asked for our bodies to be kept in the same place, together for all time, like we used to be, and we thought that the cloth would help. We thought it would remind them of how much this final request meant to us. It may not matter to them or to you, but it is what we wanted in the end, and that should be enough. It should. And this is the first part of our reading. Thank you so much. That was very, very good. Um, uh, I'll turn this now over to um, uh, Marco, who has a, a, a response that will focus on uh, law. <laughs> and then, uh, we'll then, uh, we'll then turn to other questions as well. Uh, well, thanks. Thank you, Dan, uh, Daniel. And thank you also, uh, Danish, for sharing your work with us, I, re I really enjoyed reading the plays. Um, I thought I'd offer um, just a couple of thoughts on the place of law in the in the two plays as a as a response. Um, so, you know, I, I read, when I read the plays, I thought, well, obviously, the, the two court cases have a prominent place um, in the in the two plays, and I think you know, sexual minorities have a have a really fascinating contradictory relationship with the law. And I see that this is something Tarun picks up on as well in his, uh, in his forward when he talks about the duality of law. And I think you know, there is a sense that the law can be oppressive. Uh, and I love that uh, those, those courtroom scenes um, where you know, the judges ask, well, the, so carnal intercourse against the order of nature, you know, what does that mean? And I think you know, what comes across in those scenes is that if the court is determined not to see LGBTQ people as part of the group that the law targets. The, the law kind of allows that. And this goes back to your point about you know, hearing versus listening. Right? So strictly speaking, sexual minorities are not referred to in the provision and there's a silence about them. And so if you don't want to see them, if you don't want to hear them, the law kind of allows you to do that. Um, but at the same time, the law can be emancipatory and offer hope. Right? And one line that really kind of jumped out at, at me uh, in Pride was that line by A, where he says, you know, but also it's words that sometimes it's words that words that I can hold on to. Sometimes you know, words that actually can, sorry, words that can actually do something sometimes. Um, and you know, in a sense, sexual minorities cannot live without the idea of change that the law allows. Um, and you know, the, the place prompted me to ask, well, okay, if the law can be oppressive and if the law can be emancipatory, 
you know, when is it oppressive and when is it emancipatory? You know, so when you say sometimes, what does that, what does that word mean? Um, and I thought you know, one way of thinking about that is that um, you know, we're also used to thinking of, of rights as counter-majoritarian, you know, rights protect minorities from the tyranny of the majority, the Supreme Court is the guardian of rights, a guardian of constitutions. Um, but you know, as, as some scholars have argued, at least in the US context, right, the, the Supreme Court is actually more majoritarian than we often think it is, right? In the sense that the judgments often don't stray too far from public opinion um, out of concerns about backlash. So, you know, courts are careful not to move too far too quickly um, because of concerns about how the public might react. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at something like same-sex marriage, there is a sense in which the Supreme Court would change the law only when the change already has some kind of traction amongst the public, um, when hearts and minds are already being changed. And, and I think you know, a work like Love and Reparation is so important because theater is part of what changes hearts and minds, right? And the play, uh, you know, in plays like, like, like Contempt and, and Pride can help create the conditions for legal change to happen in the courts and also can help people understand the, the kind of complexity and unevenness of the impact of that kind of change. So that's kind of the first thought. Um, another thought I had was that um, you know, th there's a, a really kind of complex and interesting relationship between law and shame. Um, and you know, there, there is a sense in which law can inadvertently produce shame in people. So if you, you know, criminalize same-sex sexual behavior, the law is casting that kind of behavior as abject, as, as deviant, as shameful. If, you, if the law allows discrimination based on sexual orientation, it's, it's basically saying it's okay to treat sexual minorities as lesser people. Um, and you know, another line that kind of jumped out at, at me was uh, in the exchange between A and the therapist and, and Pride and A, and A says, well, you know, the law didn't teach me to feel shame. Uh, and the response is, well, no, but it's doing something to you uh, about, about shame, associated with shame. And I thought that was, that was really interesting. Uh, and that part of the play brought to my mind an essay on shame by Eve Sedgwick. Um, and I, 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 I thought it was, you know, I was thinking about that part of the play in relation to Sedgwick's essay about shame. Um, and in that essay, she, you know, she, she points out that shame kind of has three characteristics. I mean, she's talking specifically about that phrase, shame on you, and contrasting it with the phrase, you know, I do in the performative utterance of I do in the marriage ceremony, right? And she says, so first of all, shame isolates. It, it cuts people off. If you're ashamed, other people don't want to be with you. Um, and I think more importantly, it, it, it causes you to push people away. And it causes you to kind of pursue the wrong people. So the law by shaming people inadvertently can do kind of strange and disturbing things to people psychologically. Um, she also talks about how the phrase shame on you has no subject. So the I as in the individual is erased from the sentence and the effacement of the self is one of the defining characteristics of shame. So in that phrase, shame on you, there is only a you which is rendered as an other. Um, and she talks about how shame also takes part in the creation of identity. So if we're shamed often enough for long enough, then shame gets built into, into an identity. Um, and you know, I, I thought pride was a, kind of, was a really poignant response to the shaming effects of law um, and, and you know, contempt as well, right? So the two plays together, I think for me, first of all, show the isolating effects of shame on the person, the kind of deep psychological impact that legally induced shame can have. Um, the place bring back the, the subject, right? so the I is given a sage and a voice um, in the play. So we're moving between, on the one hand, the millions of LGBTQ people in the community that's referred in, in court, referred to in court, so the kind of collective. Um, and then on the other hand, the individual people, you know, the affidavits and, and, and the voices 
and you know the focus on kind of the the, the complexity and the internal contradictions of the self as well. Um, and I, th I think also the pride. What I really like about it is that it's it's not unequivocally or naively hopeful. So in that final exchange between uh, Firoz and and A, I mean, my understanding is that the play ends on a kind of hopeful note. Um, you know, there's a note of of exploration, of, of possibility, of connection, um, but at the same time, it's also very attuned to. The, the fragilities and the the uncertainties that we live with, both both legally and personally. Um, so those are some of my thoughts, and I, I guess I'd, I'd end my response with a question. So you were saying, in you know, the place, explore what it means to live with the law, um, and you know, I guess my question is, well, what what does it mean to live with the law? Um, and I ask that because I think you know, to some extent. The law is always, always casting people in the shadows, right? So if you take something like same-sex marriage, queer scholars have argued that the, the, the cases that that valorize marriage, that legalize marriage, they're always implicitly you know, casting people who don't subscribe to the marriage model to the shadow, right? People who, who want to remain single, people who don't subscribe to the monogamy model. So is there a sense in which the law is always someone sending someone to therapy? Uh, and if that's the case, you know, what should we do about it? And how might theatre help us think through that? So that's um, that's what I would end with. Uh, Marco, thank you. It's such a privilege to have your work um, so closely read by you know someone in in, in such a generous and generative way. So. Uh, I think um, one thing I'm going to do after this conversation is done is listen to the recording of what you've said um, and use it for my thesis. Uh, that's, but, but, but besides that, just to kind of go to the specific question that you've asked, um, I, I was smiling when you when you brought in Eve Sedgwick because I, I use her a lot in my work. Um, she's an incredible thinker, very generative for me. And, and so I think it, it might help in speaking to your question about, right, so what does it mean to try and live with law? Which I think maybe the, the way to ask, answer that question is to first ask, what is it that I'm really arguing that the law does to us? Um, and to us right now, I can only just talk about queer Indians in a certain time and place. And so one of the arguments that I'm making is that it, it rendered you a stranger to the law. So it, 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 it queer in that sense. So it, it, it diminished your ability to relate to the law. So here I am thinking, you know, um, what it means for me to engage in acts of intimacy. And then I look at the law and the law characterizes those acts of intimacy in the language of carnal intercourse against the order of nature. So it's automatically kind of distancing me. Like, and, and that's where the idea of shame, as you kind of mentioned, comes in. Um, and there are many different ways in which the law does that. If you are queer, it's it's constantly kind of pushing you away. It's it's rendering you um, stranger. And so, why I find Eve Sedgwick in particular a useful thinker to work with is um, her work is about how we create relations, how we foster attachments, how we nurture the connections that we um, exist and or, or how we make those um, connections. And, and so my answer for now has actually been, yes, yeah, so there's a certain institutional apparatus of the law that pushes you away. And what queer people do in the margins is find other minor attachments to law. And what are those minor attachments and what do they look like? What are those creative legal practices? So, um, so either this can be in the form of crafting, um, ways of living lawfully with each other. So um, th th there's an example that I'm working on right now where you have these two queer women who enter into a companionship contract. And it's a, and it's a really interesting kind of document because it says um, it establishes a non-governmental organization. And one of the clauses in the contract is, oh, and we also promise to live with each other and give each other our friendship to the end of our days. And so, so that's one kind of way. Um, I think theater actually does become a different kind of way. So if we, if we go back to um, someone like uh, Robert Cover, who tells us that the way that we live and inhabit law is inseparable from the stories that we tell about law. Um, 
And so if, if the stories that I have grown up inhabiting are stories where um, the idea of touch is bad, for example, queer touch is just like this disgusting, awful thing. Um, and then say I walk into a theatrical performance where I'm being trained into inhabiting a different kind of normative universe where touch, where queer touch is actually beautiful and joyful. It's retraining my body in a sense. And, and so there's that sort of normative recasting of what it can mean to inhabit this different world. Um, and so in that sense, for me, a theatrical practice then becomes a legal practice in the way in which it intervenes in that normative universe. Um, but I'll maybe stop there because now I'm just going into thesis mode. <laughs> then what we'll do is we'll pass it back to Shax actually to read a section from, um, from Pride. Uh, uh, and so uh, there'll, be, there'll be one of two readings from Pride. Uh, this is the first uh, and uh, we'll come back and discuss. Thank you so much, Marco, uh, for your response. And thank you, Tanish. Witness two. My dad's all about the big declarations. When I was in the 10th grade, he needed to tell me just how proud he was about my board exam results. Instead of using his words like regular people do, he waits till we're on a flight a week afterwards. So here we are settling in when the pilot informs us, in case we're confused, that we're flying to Bangalore, that the flying time will be two hours and 20 minutes, some turbulence expected, but he wishes us a comfortable journey. Then a pause, and in a very different tone, still on the intercom, still with an earshot of all those other passengers, he wishes the young genius girl in seat 12A a huge round of applause for her board exam results. It was a long ride for a young genius. Seven years later, young genius girl becomes young genius woman and told her parents she was lesbian or well, let them find it out anyway. My attempts at the heterosexual exams did not go quite as well as my boards. I was a miserable failure at being straight and even worse at being closeted. The conversation took place over the phone. There were tears, recriminations, and then silence. Finally, in a broken voice, dad, just, dad said, just come home, just for the weekend. And so I do. Mom picks me up from the airport, and I let the car ride pass in silence, only speaking up when I see that we've taken the wrong lane. But she shakes her head at the, at the driver. It isn't a wrong turn. We are driving, I would find out, directly to the office of the friendly neighborhood psychiatrist. I say nothing. I do nothing. I let this fact seep into me. I will be calm. I will be a good young genius lesbian who deals with her forced psychiatric visits with fortitude. As we walk into the lobby, I see my father's already there and I flash him my most beatific smile. He looks as confused as I feel terrified. As I'm ushered into the good doctor's room, my parents take a seat on either side of me. Doc surveys me wordlessly for a few seconds. I look wordlessly back. Maybe this is the first test, a staring contest. Then he tilts his head sideways and leans forward. Do you know why you're here? Instead of answering, I decide to continue playing the wordless staring game. That seems so much more fun. You're here because you're homosexual. I attempt to look confused, as if he spoke in a difficult French word. How do you feel about being homosexual? At this, I break my silence. Oh, I'm actually quite happy about being lesbian. He flinches at the word lesbian, like a vampire confronted with the deli sun, but continues valiantly. So you're saying you're fine with being homosexual? Before I can get to playing the semantics game, he indicates in my mother's directions and asks me, well, so if she commits suicide because of you, that's fine, is it? You know, two can play at that game. The words have left my mouth before I realize what I've said. There is a mildly convulsive moment from either side of me, but I cannot acknowledge them. It is between me and the doctor now. He gets down to brass tracks. Look, there are three ways in which we can approach this condition. One, homosexuality might be caused by hormonal imbalances. Two, it could be a result of some tumor in the brain. 
and three, it could be caused by some other mental disorder. I take a moment to let these words sink in. I have a choice here. I can listen quietly and brush it off. No big deal, screw him. Or I can make a big scene about this and really screw him. I have a choice. I choose drama. I take out my phone, place it on the table and tell him, just so you know, I've recorded this entire conversation and you look confused and good God he does. He looks gloriously baffled. So let me tell you why I've done that. I'm going to use this as evidence for the FIR I file against you the moment I walk out of this office. It pays off almost instantly. And for the first time since we walk into his room, his smug smile wavers. What would you do that for? Well, to begin with, I tell him, I'm going to have you booked for medical malpractice and causing emotional distress. You have all these huge certificates and medals in your office, but it doesn't look like you know what, that the WHO removed homosexuality from its international classification of diseases in 1990. Calling it a mental disorder is practicing incorrect medicine. How can you not know this? Or else you knew this and still decided to pull off this nonsense. Ah, you know what? That's going to make an even better case. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a moment where I fear the inconveniently loud thud of my heart will betray me, but he jumps the panic gun first, looking to my parents. It's clear she's suffering from some form of paranoid schizophrenia. We might need some in instant aggressive treatment, but I've had enough at this point. I get up and storm out of the room, ignoring the yells, run to the first auto rickshaw I can find, a straight dash to the airport, oblivious to the insistent buzzing of my phone, unaware that I've left my suitcase back in the car. I run to the ticketing counter in a daze, by the first ride back to Delhi, another dash past security, and now down the boarding line. The trance breaks when I'm finally seated in the plane, and the pilot begins his announcement. He informs us, in case we are confused, that we are flying to Delhi, and that the flying time will be an hour and 20 minutes, and that we have clear skies ahead. There are no further announcements. We take off into the night. Therapy number one. <clears throat> so it's like you're seated in the plane, buckled in. All right. And the pilots done with their announcement, and the flight attendants have finished that dance routine you never see, but you really should. Correct. And then the plane starts to taxi on the runway, and it's slowly gathering speed. And then it's gathering more speed, till that roaring sound begins. And then if you think, oh, maybe this is when I want to get off. Maybe this is one of those flights that's going to be a statistic in the papers. But then you really can't. There's no way you can stop the flight. Theoretically, you could fake a heart attack maybe, and then they'd ground the plane, but you're not going to fake a heart attack. So you're just there strapped in and then hoping that this isn't going to become a statistic. And there is nothing you can do to stop this plane from taking off. All right. So yeah, that's what I think this is like. You think love is being on the plane, taxiing on the runway. No, not love. Uh, love. Oh, sorry. Falling in love. No, trying to stop yourself from falling in love. Oh, yes, thank you, got it. So, <clears throat> in terms of panic levels and futility, resisting the inexorable tug of falling in love is roughly equivalent to holding a speeding plane about to take off on the runway. Couldn't have put it better myself. I'm quoting your Twitter feed. Ha, <laughs> jokes. I mean, I thought it was funny. No, no, no. It was definitely funny. It was a good joke. Thank you. So you like approval? Who doesn't? Do you crave it? Everybody on social media. I'm not on social media. Well, many, many people are, and nobody puts up a message, a tweet, a picture without the hope of it receiving approval. Sure, but I'm not talking about the many other people. Okay, yes, yes, of course. I like approval, but... What does that have to do with falling in love? Maybe nothing. So how do we fix me? You're not broken. Because I'm a legal citizen now? You said illegality didn't affect you. How did you? Facebook. There's just no privacy. As your therapist. You know, doctor. Therapist. Therapist. You can use my name. Harini. 
that idea was said in a certain context. And yes, okay, while there is possibly a huge emotional cost to being an unapprehended felon, I personally was fine and unaffected. Disaffected? No, uh, unaffected. When we had the law. I mean, I'm very happy that the Uber map shows you a little rainbow now. It appeals to me aesthetically, and I'm celebrating with everyone. But yes, illegality wasn't such a burden. So, what brings you here? I was born in... We don't have to go into your childhood. So we're not going to talk about my daddy issues? When they are relevant. Because I definitely have daddy issues. Who doesn't? <sighs> Jokes! So, where do you want to start? <sighs> okay. I think 2012 is a good place to start. I'm in love. It always starts with love, with me. But this one is big. I'm in capital L, love with this guy. I thought I knew what love was. I dated other men, I'd been in proper relationships, and they'd ended, and I'd cried, and I thought I knew love. And then you meet this new person? Not new though. I first saw him in my second year in law school. He'd come to do a lecture. He was speaking about queer rights. And it wasn't one of those love at first sight things. I mean, that's not really a thing anyway. But this was. You want to know how it was different? If you want to tell me. Well, I think it might be relevant. Everything you say is relevant. Okay. He was different. It was different. We'd known each other for years. We'd stayed in touch. I finished law school. We began working in the same space, and I was seeing someone, and then this thing happened. You were with someone else? I irrelevant now, in the grand scheme of things. Okay, so this thing happened? We started reading. We read the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, Greek literature. I don't know how it began exactly, but we would just work our way through these texts. He'd mail me an essay about the philosophy of Plato, and I'd share with him a fragment of Sappho. And then we both read the symposium together. You sat and read the book together. No, not physically together. And anyways, uh, I read ebooks, and he's a physical person. Like he physically reads books, although he's also like really physically buff, I suppose. But no, uh, about books, he's all about the paper. I should probably mention he was about 10 to 15 years older than me. 10 or 15? 16. Uh, he was 16 years older than me. And we're reading the symposium. And it's about these eight men talking about love. And one of the subplots, I guess, is this older guy, Socrates, you know, the Socrates, is being pursued, frantically pursued by, these, by this young strapping lad, Alcibiades. And Socrates plays this game where he's kind of teasing Alcibiades and dazzling him with words and wisdom, but also not really going there. And one day I realized we, are, we were basically Socrates and Alcibiades. Feel free to elaborate. As in, you know, he was the older wise man, and I was the young ingenue, thirsting for wisdom, and generally thirsty. And we were in this little dance where we would throw words and ideas from the Greeks at each other every day. But nothing happened until this one night when everything came together. And what happened this night? We came together. Okay, tough crowd. And uh, actually, there was no spontaneity in our coming. I'm pretty sure he didn't actually, but we will put a pin in that. So, okay, we were at this restaurant, a bunch of us getting drunk and talking about love. And he was there, and I remember we were giving each other these little knowing glances when the conversation moved to eros, erotic love. And at some point in the evening, the two of us, Socrates and I, were alone in an elevator. The others had gone ahead, and we kissed. Finally, we kissed, and it was the most incredible thing. It was perfect. And then? Well, then we obviously had sex. Really good sex. Except for the part where I'm not sure if he came. What happened with this Socrates person generally? We got into a relationship at some point. Past tense? And at some point we got out. He got out. It took me a bit longer. You mean he moved on before you did? I mean, he dumped me, after years of not wanting to be with me. And then it took me about two years to really let go. Have you let go? Oh, I've dated other people after that. But, have you let go? We're friends, and I'm happy, and he's with someone else now. Have you let go? 
I have no desire to be with him. Have you let go? What does that mean? Good. That's a start. And that's the end of our reading part two. Thank you so much. Um, that selection is also a beautiful bridge between the two plays um, um, and, and the, the discussion of Socrates um, it will give me the excuse to ask, as Marco asked the law question, I will ask the literature question. Um, uh, the, uh, the person who wrote 377 is, uh, is T.B. Macaulay, um, uh, who also wrote the famous, uh, uh, to a post-colonial theorist, the famous line uh, that, he has a, a that he has consulted all of the experts and has decided that uh, a single shelf of a good European library is worth more than all texts written in Arabic and Sanskrit and Farsi. I believe it. He just wipes out everything, and and so this is a person who is making. Uh, this is a person who is writing law uh, uh, in British India and British Raj, and he's also uh, deciding on the status of uh, English literature and English language education. And then this, so the, this minute that he writes in 18, 1835, um, effectively in, pays, ensures that British Raj will pay for um, uh, English education um, throughout the British Raj, as opposed to uh, Hindi or uh, uh, Urdu or any kind of regional language. Um, and so I guess the, the, the kind of question I have as the excuse for this is, um, you know, uh, one imagines T.B. Macaulay's, uh, you know, lovely li European library shelf, and it includes works like uh, the Symposium. It includes works like perhaps uh, Shakespeare, uh, and it includes all of these works of, uh, you know, um, great the, the great Western tradition, uh, as someone like T.B. Macaulay would certainly want, or Matthew Arnold, or, or any of these kind of figures that. Uh, and yet, right, what you've done, I think, which is so beautiful, is, is you bring that Western tradition to bear uh, on questions of, of sexuality in the present, of questions of, uh, of response to colonialism uh, in the present. Uh, and so I'm curious, I mean, I, we've, we've talked about this before, but I, I would love to hear you say even more about it, uh, this kind of relationship that you see between uh, you know, the kind of these the, the canon of literature that you are you're drawing your citations and sources and references on to, and its use as a certain way of speaking back to um, uh, you know, colonial law, um, or even you know, the, the legal system itself, which is structured on you know, exclusion, uh, 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 much like the literary canon. Uh, so. um, thanks, Daniel. That's, that's a really beautiful question. and. And, I, and I, maybe the word to think about in responding to that is the idea of inheritance and um, a, that what, what you get to inherit and, um, what, and, and so, so, the, so the choices that we make or, or the things that we don't get, get to make a choice about inheriting. And so um, for me, in some ways, um, so if, you, if you're growing up in a certain time and place, and this is India of, um, the, the late 80s and the 90s, your inheritances include this law, which you can't really disavow, and then you do something with it. Um, and then what I didn't logically, culturally inherit was Shakespeare. Actually, I, I first encountered Shakespeare um, in my early 20s in <laughs> in Ann Arbor, so on the other side of the world. So, so there's something I'm hilarious about this because you have this brown queer in the US um, watching a Shakespeare in the Park production. So sort of like the opposite, like some sort of post-colonial nightmare. And um, but what was what was incredible was so um so I'm there and I'm watching this and and it it was completely it really blew my mind. So it was a production of Much Ado About Nothing. And um and that's that's one of Shakespeare's more legalistic plays in certain ways. It it looks at questions of evidence and truth telling and who should be believed and who should be disbelieved. And, and that's all I could see at that point, um, you know? So it was, it was a way of translating ideas of justice and ideas of the law. And so I, I took that back with me. Um, um, I, I was in the US for a master's at that point and, and I go back to India. And then I thought, let's start a Shakespeare in the Park group, why not? Um, 
you know, it, it can't be that difficult. And the funny thing is it really wasn't that difficult. Um, there were enough um, people who were just willing to go along with the whole thing. Um, and, and again, it was, it was about translating Shakespeare, but not translating Shakespeare in the sense of translating the language, but translating Shakespeare through um, a lens of law and justice. And, and so um, we, we settled on doing this production of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, um, and where, except that we kind of switched things around so that both the couples in, in the, so I won't go into the plot, if, if you're not familiar, it'll take an entire day to recount it. But essentially, um, there's this moment in, uh, in, in our version of Midsummer where heterosexuality becomes a disease and it has to be kind of dealt with. Um, and, and we were performing this in this public park in Bangalore uh, it was a free performance and then somehow by the end of the day it attracted a thousand plus revelers and this is again a time when homosexuality is criminalized so this is really complicated what's happening here right so you're drawing on this other kind of colonial legacy which the words of Shakespeare and then as you um the, the great phrase to you speaking back um and, and in some ways I think that has been my ethos so assembling fragments of things that don't necessarily um, neatly fit within my tradition, claiming inheritance to them, and then using them in different kinds of combinations. And so I think that that ethos is is mirrors in some ways the ethos of the queer people that or the queer lives that I want to capture. So what I think I do with law is also I think what I do with literature, and I reassemble. Um, yeah. One of the, the other things that I think you do really beautifully is, uh, you know, and I think Marco pointed this out as well, is you know, kind of show how the law seeps into other places, right? Uh, and in the last reading, right, of course, you, 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 it seeps into the, the field of medicine. Uh, you know, so the uh, something that is a legal category then becomes actually then a medical category, a psychiatric category. Um, and uh, and and it be, and, and 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 this is something that I, mean, I think, especially the the Indian legal tradition so since the since fifty one has taken quite seriously is is the way that the legal that the law the, the Supreme Court or uh, any kind of legal institution uh, seeps into other realms. So in, in one case, psychiatric, but in the case of someone like I think the B M B R and Bedka, uh, you know, the, the law seeps into the social and and, uh, and 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 so everything that has to be legal also has to be thought of as social as well those are inextricable for him and this is kind of his draft of the Indian constitution really took this seriously um and and so and this goes this of course goes back to the question of shame uh, you know, and, and 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 for Ambedkar the, it was the reverse it was respect uh and so uh one of the, and one of the key uh, distinctions between the 2012 ruling and the 2018 ruling is uh, is this uh, citation from Ambedkar that you know the to to decriminalize homosexuality is to to give respect to minorities uh, in advance of and on the expectation that uh, this, they would seep into society um, and that would be the rule of the court um, and so I, I in the same in the same ruling I guess. Uh, alongside in Bidka, there is uh, a quote from um, Shakespeare, uh, uh, which is, uh, I believe, or is it, is it, is it, is it something about a rose, uh, uh, just comparing rose to somebody, Romeo and Juliet. Um, I, you can see this is not my inheritance. <laughs> um, uh, and so, I mean, I, I, I'm curious to hear you say more about the kind of way that these, these spheres that we think of usually is trying to think of it as autonomous, the law, uh, medicine, society, uh, the social realm, or the, you know, the, the political realm, uh, are, are much more porous. Uh, and, it's, and that comes through very, very clearly and beautifully in, in these two plays. Um, so, I, 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 you know, one of the ways in which I'm trying to think through that is, um, I, I wonder what it is that's peculiar about legal form. Um, and, and so um, when I first 
wrote these plays and I started performing them, I, I would keep going on about how, you know, my practice of law is my practice of theater, they're inseparable. And it sounded like a very cool thing to say, um, but also um, it's actually kind of messy and not completely helpful, um, even for, for me to kind of understand what I'm doing. Um, and, and so at some point I had to start separating the two and saying, okay, A, when I am, so, so A, there's, a, there's an institutional question. So when, when lawyers speak in a court of law, they are creating a certain set of relations. The lawyer is creating a relationship with the judge. You have to speak in a certain register. I can't just impose a certain literary form there just because that sounds better to me. Um, similarly, when I'm in the theatrical space, um, if I were to just plomp these transcripts there, um, I would um, probably be a very unsuccessful show um, because it would just be incredibly boring and, 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 and you wouldn't really take anything away from it. So there are certain things that you do in, in the theatrical sphere. You have to think about affect in a very clear kind of way. So, so that was A, that. Um, but then the other thing that I started thinking about was um, even in a space that's not institutional law, so even in a space that's not the courtroom, we still, there are still ways in which you do engage in law-like behavior and law-like speech. And so what, and so that's the question legal form for me. So, um, so, so therapy is one of those connections between the plays because um, in, in, in the first play, you have this encounter that's happening in the courtroom. Um, there's a give and take, there's, uh, you can think of it as legal submissions or an inquiry to reach some kind of truth. Um, that dialogue becomes the dialogue of therapy in the second play. And in the first play, while the judges refuse to listen, in the second play, the therapy space is all about listening, but it's structured like a legal dialogue, right? So you are engaged in this mutual pursuit for some sort of what you hope is a truth that you can hold on to. Um, and so, and, and, I, and I guess in some ways that's, that's the thing that I've then been trying to do. So saying that there are many ways in which we, we engage in lawful behavior in everyday life, we cling to legal form in everyday life. And that's the thing that law can give us. And, um, and if it's not completely obvious by now, I don't <laughs> I have a very uncynical take on law uh, and on what law can do. And it's not necessarily very trendy uh, with, you know, the liberal critique of rights or whatever, but that's, yeah, that's where this is coming from. What I think we might do is, uh, uh, just because we are running out of time uh, and we, I, and I'd love to open this up to more conversation is we'll jump to the uh, uh, final reading um, uh, from Shax. And I, I, I apologize in advance. Uh, this, I think this selection uh, uh, does not feature um, any, I, to my knowledge, does not feature anything uh, that refers to suicide or sexual violence or trauma. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, it, it is very likely that uh, con the continued discussions might feature those things. And so I just want to make sure that uh, if that's something that uh, is, uh, might, might trigger a kind of uh, a certain type of trauma, uh, that, that, that you should know about it in advance. And I apologize for not actually having said that sooner. Um, uh, but I'll hand it over to um, uh, Shax for the final reading. Thank you. Interlude. Two thousand and one. That is when it began. This is a case about patience, perseverance. We have been doing this for two decades, longer actually. But if you want to be official about history, then yes, we filed the petition in December two thousand and one. Nobody was talking about this issue. Nobody knew what the petition was about. The media was not on our side. But we filed it. Not everyone was happy with us. They said we had jumped the gun. They asked what would happen if we lost. They said, why bring attention to a law that is barely being used? But the law was being used. That year, the police had conducted raids on an NGO in Lucknow, an NGO that was working on HIV AIDS and arrested some of its staff for abetting the crime under Section 377. That's how easy it was for the law to get a hold of you. So that year, we filed the petition before the Delhi High Court. And then two years later, the court took notice, only to dismiss us. 377 is an academic issue, they said. 
an academic issue. Nobody is affected by this law. Did we give up? No. We took to the streets. We marched and rallied. We spoke up. More people joined the case. More groups came together. It was a marathon and we ran it tirelessly. And then in 2019, we won. And we could breathe as a community, as lawyers, as activists, as civil society, we could breathe for a while. But only for a while, because then an astrologer decided to file an appeal before the Supreme Court. Suresh Kumar Kaushal. Didn't have anything to do with the case, but the court decided to take up the appeal anyway. We thought we were safe. But to be sure, we worked at getting more briefs before the court. Parents of LGBT persons, mental health practitioners, teachers, a member of parliament, all these groups came together before the court. But the court didn't hear us then. They called us a minuscule minority. They said we didn't deserve our so-called rights. But we didn't give up. We continued to fight. We took the fight back to the court. People are talking about it as if the case began only in the last two years. Some five rich celebrities wake up one day and decided to file their own case, and suddenly that's the only story. We're not saying we initiated the case. We're saying we brought the new strategy. It's not your turn. You'll get your chance. Like you got your chance for 20 years? Exactly my point. We fought for 20 years. More than that. This is an almost three decade long fight. This is a story about perseverance. And finally, we have prepared an excerpt from Final Therapy. I'm just not sure how me talking or not talking about Socrates is relevant to the larger point. And what is the larger point? I just shouldn't be dating anybody. For? For good. At all. I just need to step out out of the game. It doesn't seem to work out for me or the others. It just doesn't work out. All of these stories, they just, I mean, they're disasters, aren't they? I've been reading the Greeks, the symposium. You read Pato? You keep going on about it. You read Pato for me? Do you know how much you pay me? So you know... So you know the Aristophanes speech? Do I know the earth is round? I'm sorry, please go. So Aristophanes tells us about how long ago human beings existed in pairs. Like fused together, yes. And they were happy and content roaming around in pairs all the time. So happy that they didn't need anything or anybody else, including the gods. So the gods decide to punish them. Zeus sends down thunderbolts that rip apart all the pairs and they're scattered in different parts of the world. And they're lonely and separated from the person they were meant to be with. And the only way they'll feel complete again is if they find the other person they were separated from. They'll stop feeling pain and love will repair them. It's a nice story. Do you believe it? I mean, people believe that dead men get resurrected. People believe that prophets fly on horses. People believe that demonetization was a good idea. What do you believe? Obviously, I don't think there is some Big Bang theory of the origin of love. And I don't think we were all fused together in an early state of harmony. And the rest of it? I think that, I feel that, it isn't the stupidest idea that there might be a person who gets what it is like, who understands you as well as you understand yourself, or maybe even better. And that when you meet and you connect, it's like everything falls into place. Like the moment in the elevator with Socrates? The elevator was real. That was a real moment. So you found the person you were supposed to find, and then you lost them. Or let them get away, yes. Can you take me back to the elevator? Aren't you exhausted with that story? Can you walk me through it once more? We get into an elevator. Sexy times happen. Years later, I'm in therapy. Cool, cool. All right, it's 2012. There's eight of us sitting on a rooftop, getting drunk, talking about love. Was it eight? Yeah, like in the symposium. But are you sure it was eight? Yes, I'm here. There's two people to my right. Then there's Socrates diagonally across. And then next to him, there's one, two people. So that's... Seven. Right, right. Okay, seven. 
Do you think you remembered eight because that fit more neatly with the symposium story? It's a good story, but whatever, seven, eight, doesn't matter. How many people could the elevator hold? Six. Was it pure chance that the two of you stayed upstairs? He took a step forward, and I grabbed the back of his shirt. I held him back. So you ensured that the two of you would get a ride in that elevator alone? I influenced the odds. And when you got inside, what happened? That part doesn't change. We kissed. What was going through your head? That it was the most amazing kiss. That it was the most beautiful moment of my life. I had been in love with this man for years, and now... What else was going through your head? That we were both cheating on our boyfriends. What else? That my boyfriend was one of his closest friends. How did that make you feel? I told you, I'm not Martin Luther King. You said Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King actually did have a string of extramarital affairs. Uh, but go on. I know I should have been guilty. I know I should have felt wrong. For me, in that moment, all I could see, all I could think was, I was in love. I was in the moment that I thought I had waited for my entire life. I thought this was it. And what did he feel? He... Did he feel the same way? I thought it was exciting. I thought it was fun. It was great. But that was all. What did he say? We can't tell anyone. You can't tell anyone. And what did you want? I wanted to run through the streets and grab people and tell them that the most incredible thing had happened. I wanted to write the news in the skies. I was exploding with joy and I wanted the world to know. But he was ashamed. You tell anyone and this is over. He was ashamed. It was wrong. Not wrong enough to end things with me. Not wrong enough to walk away from this. Just wrong enough to not tell the world. The world would have judged us. So you decided to do all the judging yourself? It was good enough for you then. It was. I thought it was all I deserved. I thought it was all I deserved. If I couldn't have all of his love, I'd settle for the little scraps he threw my way. You like narratives. You like stories. All of us do, obviously. The only problem with the grand unifying narrative is that it can be incomplete. This is a case about bringing people's lives into the courtroom. No, it's about how you've ignored our life stories. I think it's about how people can have conversations in spaces where it wasn't impossible. No, it's about how we get to gay marriage. It's about honoring the decades of struggle that got us here. Thank you very much, and this is the end of the reading, part three. Thank you once more uh, for Shax, uh, to Shax for participating and being a part of this reading. It's, it's, it's really great to have you uh, uh, give us a sense of the play as we talk about it. Um, I'll hand it over to uh, Alvin. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, I actually have um, I've written two pages of response, but in the interest of time, I wanted to touch on something that Daniel, of course, um, to Marco's fabulous uh, reading of um, the law as well, which is, um, I find the earlier discussion about uh, the intersection of law and literature to be really intriguing. And I find the plays uh, numerous intertextual uh, references to Plato's symposium to be um, smart, humorous, but also I wanted to read it as, um, as a way in which the play uh, also disrupts the supposed uh, transparency and constitutionality of the law. So the play's uh, retelling of the figure of uh, Alcibiades who flaunts his queerness and erotic openness uh, against the supposedly uh, philosophically mind and therefore sexless uh, Socrates, uh, I think it can also serve as a literary opening and perhaps an analogy. It points to the absurdity of the legal interpretations of section 377 that supposedly treats all Indian citizens equally and punishes all those who commit crime against nature, while in its everyday um, police harassment, uh, vilification of LGBT people, and unequal distribution of rights, um, the state indeed singles out LGBT and queer sexual minorities. 
So um, the courtroom that upholds the validity of um, the penal code is not unlike the figure of Socrates in Symposium, who speaks in the name of uh, objectivity and the higher moral grounding of the mind and philosophy while denying the corporeality of eros, embodiment, desire, and indeed there are numerous forms of oppression. So the framing of the law as uh, supremely objective um, is brought out very clearly in the earlier session, uh, the colonial legacy. So there were a bunch of uh, back and forth, right, uh, of the of the judge who asked, well, where in the where in the section three seventy seven do you see it mentioning LGBT? And then the lawyer uh, keep uh, referring back, well, or, or or arguing back to the law that they are not explicitly mentioned, but we have overwhelming evidence to show how over the past 150 years, it is the LGBT person who have been targeted under this law. So I feel that actually all the scenes, uh, as you mentioned, Daniel, earlier about um, the, the lesbian, the radical lesbian, a rebellious figure who are forced to go to the um, uh, psychiatry, um, the the telling of the testimony of the um, transgender hedra figure who speaks against the uh, rape, the gang rape, and even the lawyers who um, who shows that actually the judge are the one who is being irrational, right? They keep evading the questions. And I think that these figures also somehow um, correlates to the figure of Alcibiades, who keeps reappearing in the play as this figure of queer disruption, right? So I feel that this sort of contradiction between Socrates and Alcibiades actually serves some interesting recurring force in the play. Now, um, towards the part that um, the theater group just read, um, the parts about pride, I think it also is such a wonderful sort of um, um, parts that um, that um, parallel, I guess, follows up the first play in which uh, after, in the aftermath of the decriminalization and, and it's uh, thinks through whether this is a kind of legal progress or whether this mode of queer liberalism actually enables substantive transformations both uh, individually and collectively. And I find a conversation between uh, A, who is the gay male, a uh, gay man in his late 20s, early 30s, versus the psychiatrist, um, the female psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, Tarini, uh, to be really smart and funny. Um, and it turns out that, right, A uh, once fell in love with a man who is, uh, who is sort of like Socrates, right, who's like to drop literary reference while he himself feels unworthy of love from this love interest. And uh, one and the most powerful moment that I found was actually the part that proceeds right before the reading by the theater group just now, which is the part he confesses to T that uh, one way in which he still feel a bit shameful is the fact that when he was 10 years old in middle school or high school, I guess, um, he was, uh, there was a new student coming into the classroom and he turns out to be more queer and more effeminate than he himself. And he took the moment to start bullying um, the queer figure so that he himself won't be bullied by others. I thought this just is such a wonderful queer disruption again, right? It's a kind of disruption to this narrative of progress and queer liberalism in which, well, after decriminalization, we can all sort of go out and sort of flag our rainbow flag. Well, in fact, um, these, um, these moments of shame and these moments of the past of him uh, return, I guess the return of a repression just sort of disrupts this uh, progress narrative. And uh, he's still working through with this. So I guess my overall question is, uh, why do you include this sort of narrative of bullying into the play, which is, I guess, bullying is also part of the legal narrative. And also, um, what's the place of psychoanalysis in the play? There are so much references to, well, the name of the play reparation, but also these return of the repress and um, 
yeah, so on and so forth. So I'm just sort of curious how uh, the language of psychoanalysis informs your writing of the play as well. Um, thanks a lot, Avon. So I think one of the things that happens every time I hear that kind of, um, um, you know, really rich commentary on the play is I learn a lot. <laughs> and 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 I, I guess that's 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 thanks firstly thank you uh, for the because I'm still <laughs> thinking about the point of how Alcibiades might actually make a reference or a return through every scene every witness scene in contempt that's such a great catch my god um, I love it <laughs> so um, so yeah, I'm still a bit high on that so anyway but <laughs> going to the specific question about um, the language of psychoanalysis. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think uh, this might, it, 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 I mean, I, I think I'd uh, try to respond to this question in one way um, just before when uh, I was talking about um, legal language and how it structures the language of therapy. Um, but I suppose the other interesting thing or, or the other reference point for me when I was writing Pride was actually another work by Eve Sedgwick. So this is, um, I don't know the memoir. I suppose this is an early work of um, auto fiction, maybe, but it's it's called a dialogue on love. And so it's um, um, yeah. So for for those of us who aren't familiar with this text, it's essentially Sedgwick recounting years of therapy in the form of what she calls a texture book. So it's her, it's it's she somehow gets her uh, psychoanalyst's notes about her, uh, and she puts them in conversation with her own thoughts about therapy. And, and so the thing again, uh, and that's not a memoir. And like I said, this is not a memoir, but what that is, and I think what this also was, is a writing of the self and a training of the self into a form of therapy. So I think like one of the things I was trying to do also was heal myself, if that makes sense, um, and, and, and train myself into kind of saying, all right, so these are the lessons that, this body has now accrued over time. Um, so so that, that's obviously one valence in which to think about reparation. The other obvious psychoanalytic thing, which uh, I see that we have only two minutes to go um, before this event formally ends. So I won't go, go too deep into that, but um, I was influenced by the work of Melanie Klein as it interacts with the work of Eve Sedgwick. So this idea about how, you know, there is a point um, when we experience love, where we um, where we fragment parts of ourselves, and um, you can, if you uh, you can through a certain therapeutic process, assemble those hateful fragments into something that offers you solace. Um, and here, of course, the the hateful fragments are the law, right? The bits of the law that you kind of hold on within you. Um, and, and the idea was also as, as the play kind of progresses, how is this person trying to find a different kind of relationship with those fragments that he carries within himself? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, thank you for that. I, I, I will be thinking about it for a while. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alan, that was beautiful. Thank you, Danish, and thank you, Shax, thank you, Marco. And thank you everyone for coming. I, I, I mean, if if Danish is willing and is not too exhausted, uh, uh, and Christine is not too exhausted, uh, and Shax is not too exhausted, I would be happy to stick around and keep talking. Uh, uh, but I will, I will make sure that it's okay before I. Yes. Um, well, maybe maybe we can just let everyone who would like to leave just. Um, say it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah. If, but yes, so have a great evening. Thanks for coming if you need to leave now. But if you're able to stay or if you want to stay and have questions for discussion, um, I, I would be happy to keep hanging out on Zoom. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Again, thank you to Christine and Gina for organizing. Thanks to Shax uh, for being here. Thank you, Marco and Alvin for your beautiful responses. And thank you and congratulations to Danish um, for two beautiful plays now in one, one place. Um, so if you have questions, uh, I mean, there's, there's two ways um, of uh, letting me know. One is to type them in the chat box and I would be happy to read them. Um, another is to use the hand wave um, 
uh, the raised hand uh, thing on uh, down below. Um, uh, or you could, I, th I think if the chats just wave physically at me. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> sorry, well, uh